so my trucking route is from here in Connecticut all the way down to Kentucky and Tennessee. It's a pretty good run, I get to see pretty much all the sights the east coast has to offer, but there's one area of the country that gets pretty wild, and that's the area around the Appalachian Mountains. You guys probably know that it's one of the poorest areas of the country, one that got really screwed over as the coal mining jobs started to dwindle and the local economy went down the pooper. I really feel for the people down there, seeing how entrenched in poverty some of the families are is just heartbreaking. So I was rolling through an area of the state that I hadn't previously been through, thanks to my usual section of highway being blocked off by some huge traffic accident that had unfortunately left a few people dead. It was having some trouble navigating the roads after my phone ran out of battery and, wouldn't you know it, the plug charger decides to give out too. Worst timing ever. But I was an experienced truck driver and I wasn't driving on an 18-wheeler on that particular run so I was free to take some of the smaller roads to find my way around. But despite the fact that I consider myself pretty good on the roads, there was a point that I found myself hopelessly lost and I started to worry that I wouldn't make my shipping delivery deadline. That would mean disciplinary proceedings and whatnot and I just couldn't afford those at all. Anyway. I happen to see this one guy wandering down the side of the road, so I slow my truck, wind down the window, and ask him for directions. The guy seems friendly enough and is more than willing to take a few minutes to give me all the information I need on how to make it back onto the main highways that head south. But then I start asking him if there's anywhere nearby that I'd be able to get some lunch, as it was getting towards one in the afternoon and I'd only managed to get myself a pretty meager breakfast. The guy seems to think for a minute, scratching his head, taking an unusually long time to think of an answer to a question that usually takes like seconds to answer. It's rare to be anywhere in West Virginia where there isn't a cracker barrel within a few miles, so why he didn't just point me in the direction of one of those was beyond me. When I pressed him, he told me he knew of an old family-run place that did the best chicken fried steak in the entire county, maybe even the state. Suddenly, all was forgiven. I might be a northerner, but I'll be darned if I turned down a good chicken fried steak. All that was taking so long was for him to try and remember the best way there that wouldn't take me down some run-down old dirt road, one which might get my truck stuck on it, which really would have left me screwed. So after a minute, he gives me some pretty detailed directions towards an old strip mall. He told me it was mostly abandoned, but that that restaurant was still there, along with a few other small businesses, and not to pay any mind if the place seemed quiet during lunch, as it did the majority of its business in the early to late evening. I was happy enough, thanked the guy, then set off following the directions he'd given me. It took me a little while to find the old strip mall the guy was talking about. It was honestly a little frustrating to drive past a couple of chain restaurants and whatnot, given that I was so hungry. But man, if I wasn't craving some of that country-style chicken fried steak, and if it was a family-run place, then all the better. That chain restaurant stuff just doesn't cut it compared to a real home-style cooking. But eventually I actually find this run-down old strip mall the guy seemed to be talking about, and it was little wonder the place was in such a state of disrepair. It was way off any highway. There was absolutely no signage for it, literally nothing to let anyone know it was there. But even worse... I saw zero indication that there was any kind of restaurant open in any of the units. I wasn't about to give up so easily though, as I did see one place that had a big old sign over it saying something like Mama J's Country Kitchen or some variation on that, so my hopes were restored. That's when I see a guy open up the door of the place, stepping out into the afternoon heat and staring over at my truck. I gave him away from the driver's side overjoyed that I was finally about to get some decent food on what had been a long, lonely drive from Connecticut. I figured he hadn't seen me do it, that the sun was obscuring his vision or something just because he continued to stare back at me. Anyway, I get out of my truck, lock the doors, and start walking over to the restaurant. I call out to the guy like halfway across the parking lot asking if they were indeed open for business. Again, the guy doesn't react. He just keeps staring at me in a way that... I now notice is distinctly unwelcoming. Something in my gut just told me to stop walking. I had this creeping feeling all over my body like something was telling me that something was horribly wrong with this whole setup. 
and no sooner had I started feeling distinctly vulnerable than the guy reached behind his back, pulls something out of his back pocket, and puts it on his head. I thought it was like a woolly hat at first, but then he pulls it down. It's like a balaclava. Then I notice something else in his hand, a small revolver. I turn and start running back towards the truck, and as I do, I see a few other guys emerging from the derelict units, each running towards my truck to try and cut me off. Each had some kind of weapon in their hand, be it a knife or an iron bar, and seeing those just made me run even faster. Thank God I'd gotten that gut feeling when I did, otherwise they'd have definitely made it to my truck before I did. I threw the door open, jumped inside, and locked the cab behind me, trembling as I rummaged in my pocket for the keys. The bandits surrounded the cab of my truck, hitting the chassis with their weapons and demanding I get out. Then the guy with the gun aimed that thing right at my face through the windshield, screaming for me to get out of the truck. I had no choice but to do what I did. I gunned the engine and plowed the whole bunch of them, knocking down those that didn't jump out of the way in time. I leaned down in my seat as I gripped the wheel out of pure instinct really and again, I thank God that I did, because when I hit the guy with the gun, he let loose a single shot that shattered the windshield and struck the seat just above my head. I circled around the parking lot expecting the next shot to come at any moment, but only the bandits that had gotten out of the way of my initial truck charge were chasing me. Two or three were just lying on the concrete, rolling around in pain whilst holding onto their limbs. I think that's about the only thing that saved me, having the presence of mind to just ram them instead of trying to reverse out of there. If that had been my choice, I might not be around to tell you all this. I got out of that parking lot, speeding off blindly in the first direction I could, until I found somewhere to safely park up and call the cops. The sheriff's deputy I spoke to told me to swing on by the department when I was next able to so I could give a statement and I did so but not until I actually managed to get myself some lunch, as not even the terror of almost getting hijacked could dull my appetite. I guess that makes me sound pretty fat or whatever, but you guys need to appreciate just how hungry I was. Down at the department, however, I learned that I was not the first truck driver to have run into these bandits, how I'd been just unlucky enough to ask directions from one of their kinfolk who had directed me to the rundown strip mall just before calling his buddies to let them know I'd be there. At least, that's the only conclusion we came to once I described the guy I'd asked directions from. The deputy just seemed to nod knowingly when I related this guy's physical description. I guess I'm just warning you guys to be very, very careful when you're out on the roads. And although it seems like some tired old cautionary tale from your Facebook posting aunt, be careful when you're talking to strangers. There's no way of knowing just who they really are. I drive trucks for a living here in England. It was one of the only jobs I could pretty much just walk into after being medically discharged from the army. The Royal Logistics Corps, to be specific, with some pretty intense back problems. I had tried physiotherapy, yoga, acupuncture, all sorts of things, but sitting in the cab of a military truck for such long periods had really done a number on my spine. It was horrible that I was basically forced into the same line of work only in the civilian world, and I had no choice but to take a daily regimen of pretty strong pain medications just to make it through the days and nights of long-distance truck driving, but that's neither here nor there, I suppose. I'd only been working for the company I'm at presently for about six or seven months when I was driving down this lonely stretch of road just outside of Rotherham in South Yorkshire. There I see this young woman at the side of the road, bags in hand, with her thumb out like she was looking to hitchhike. It's not like I don't see a few good hitchhikers on my routes. There's much more common than you might expect, especially during the summer months when people can afford to be standing at the side of the road, sometimes for hours at a time, waiting for lifts. I never normally stop for them. I've seen enough horror movies to know that you're inviting trouble on yourself if you just let a total stranger into your truck for long distances. But there was something about this girl that actually had me slowing down and stopping at the roadside for her. I don't know if it was how young she was or how desperate she looked. 
and she definitely didn't look like the kind of scruffy hippie types or dodgy cardboard sign holders that I normally see standing out there. So, there I was, actually opening up my cab door and helping her climb inside. I asked her where she was looking to go, only to have her reply something like, Anywhere, just drive. This bothered me a bit, I'll be honest, as I didn't really like the idea of having someone just sat in the passenger seat for the foreseeable future. I'm not exactly the most sociable person, and awkward silences are annoying for me at the best of times, let alone when it's some girl that's half my age. God knows what people would think if they saw that I was stopping for random girls, probably that I was some sort of perv or whatever. So, I asked her again, only rephrasing the question so that I make it clear that I can't just have her sitting in my truck for the foreseeable future, as I'd be looking for somewhere to stay overnight at some point. I know it sounds a bit mean, and I didn't want to have to properly look after this girl, paying for her food, paying for a hotel room and all that. I'd never picked up a hitchhiker before, but they're usually set on a certain place that you can just drop them off there, right? And after a bit of awkward silence, and I made it clear that I loathe those, I asked her why she was on the road. She didn't give too much away in the way of specifics, just that she was having trouble at home and needed to get away. I asked if it was a fight with her parents, or a boyfriend, or something, and that maybe she shouldn't just run away from her problems, but go back and fix whatever it was, you know, like address the issue or whatever instead of just straight up avoiding it. But she immediately took issue with the fact that I'd asked after a potential boyfriend, saying that she'd get out immediately if I had any funny ideas about where this was going. That made the whole thing feel even more awkward, and I reassured her that I did in fact have a long-term girlfriend at home, and that I certainly wasn't in the habit of picking up young girls from the side of the road. I'm basically explaining that I'm not a perv when I see a police car pass us on the road. Nothing unusual, so it barely registers other than for me to make sure I'm not over the speed limit or anything, you know, the usual I just saw police car anxieties. But a moment later, I hear sirens behind me, looking into the rear view to see what appeared to be the very same car, having turned around to follow me with a view to pulling me over. I groan, saying something about hoping my brake lights aren't out, something along those lines, and slowly begin to pull my truck over to the side of the road. This is right when the girl in the passenger seat freaks out and starts pleading with me not to pull over. I mean, not just pleading, she's begging obviously getting really panicked at the idea of the police seeing her. Now this made me feel really bloody nervous. What had she done that made her nervous around the police, and how would that reflect on me if I was caught with her in the cab of my truck? These questions are whirling around my head as I tell her to calm down and that I had absolutely no other choice than to pull over, that I was hardly about to get into a high-speed police pursuit on account of a complete stranger. She bursts into tears at that point, just sinking her head into her hands and weeping. But she doesn't try to run away, nothing like that. So that sort of reassured me that she hadn't committed some sort of violent crime, or at least she wasn't some hardened criminal on the run from the law. I watched the policeman that had pulled me over get out of his car and walk up to the side of the truck, which also happened to be the side that the girl is sat on. As soon as he looks through the window, I hear him say something like, Get out of the truck, Natalie. This obviously had taken me aback. Who was this girl that the police were on bloody first name terms with her? She's crying and sobbing, but looks up and screams, No, through the glass. The policeman motions for me to wind down my window, and I actually hesitate for a moment. The girl, this Natalie, is obviously terrified of being arrested or whatever was about to happen. The policeman then says something over his radio, something I didn't catch because of the glass in the way, so... In order to better hear what he's saying, I start winding down the window. It was too late to hear what he said on the radio, but I did hear what he said next. Your parents called again, Natalie. They're tired of you running away like this, and quite frankly, I'm tired of having to come and fetch you every time this happens. I suppose I knew all I needed to from what he just said then, but I looked on in a kind of grim fascination as what unfolded next. They're not my parents. Why won't any of you understand that? The girl started to scream. Every time you drag me back there, they do worse and worse things to me and call it punishment. They say it's for my own good, but it's not. It's not at all. She then turns to me, pulling her sleeve and showing me all kinds of burns and scars up her arm, 
ones that were so pronounced and gross that I recoiled in disgust and horror. Please, I'm begging you don't let them take me back. I'll do anything. Just please don't let them take me again. What was I supposed to do? Drive off with this girl and get chased by the police? She could have been mentally ill or something, severely delusional with a self-harm problem, and I'm just going to drive her off into the middle of nowhere so she can run away from her care home or something? Besides, I was terrified. Absolutely terrified. Police backup arrived, and when there was enough of them, they dragged the girl out of the truck, kicking and screaming before they threw her in the back of a police car and drove away. I tried to ask one of the police what had just happened, and I expected to get an answer along the lines of one of my previous suspicions, but they actually just waved me away, told me it was none of my business and that I shouldn't have been picking up young women from the side of the road anyway. I still don't know what happened to that girl, and I hope she's gotten the treatment she needs, but part of me wonders if I'd help prolong some horrible cycle of abuse, one in which the actual police were complicit. I've been a long-haul truck driver for a good few years now. I find it pretty enjoyable to be honest, it just suits my lifestyle. I've never been the most sociable person so I actually really like the whole thing of it just being me with nothing but my stereo system and the open road for company. My job has taken me to some incredible places too, things that regular 9 to 5 office workers just never get to see from their dusty dimly lit office spaces. Even those with views from skyscrapers and stuff, they never see the landscape change, how the sun frames mountain ranges or the moon shimmers off boundless lakes. Even with all the built up areas, this country really is beautiful in parts. Wyoming and Montana are some of my favorites, the mountain ranges and prairies being like picture postcards in places. But, and I mean no offense here, but the Iowa cornfields get so tedious in places because there's literally nothing but cornfields as far as the eye can see. However, my least favorite place to drive in the entire country has to be Louisiana. Again, I mean absolutely no offense to any native sons of the Bayou State, I've had some of the best fried catfish I'd ever tasted in little roadside diners while rolling through that place, but there's something inherently creepy about Louisiana too. Maybe it's just the humidity, the gators, or the way the Cajuns can just switch from English to French on a dime and shut you right out of a conversation. The whole southern hospitality is as real as I'm surely breathing, and I really have met some of the nicest, most generous people in the entire country down in Louisiana. I'm talking the kind of people that would give their last dollar or the shirt off their backs, but I guess it just takes a place of extremes because I've also met some of the least welcoming and quite frankly, most terrifying people I'd ever met in my whole life down there. And this here is the story of one of those encounters, one that still keeps me up at night sometimes and that takes a few glasses of vodka just to shut the memories out. So this one time, I'm rolling along this highway late in the evening, way behind schedule on a shipment due in Dallas, Texas. The tight timing meant it looked like I was going to have to pull another brutal all-nighter to get my load to the depot on time. But if that was going to be the case, I'd have to stop at some roadside crawfish shack to fill up on greasy food and coffee so I had the energy to keep going. So I turned my truck off the road at the first place I saw. This place with a glowing luminous sign that flashed with half the letters missing but it was all I needed to see. Rustin Crawfish Shack the place was called and it was little more than a collection of sheet metal shacks at the side of the road. But hey... Those are the kind of places where some Cajun mama bear has been making the same delicious po' boys for the last 30 years, and god I just love what those people can do with a few shrimp and a slice of lemon. So I order up some food, get it to go, and then sit outside to wolf it down before I'm back on the road when some older black guy comes up to ask me where I'm from. He was pretty friendly, and I don't mean to be judgmental here, but he had a very, very unusual appearance. He dressed normally, had close cropped hair, but he was very, very skinny, like unnaturally skinny, like he was just skin and bones with no muscle keeping his body upright whatsoever. I tell him up north originally, but that I'm based in Arkansas for my job, and we start just casually talking about the area and its history. 
He was a nice enough guy, but I had to excuse myself, telling him if I didn't get this load to Dallas Depot on time that I'd be in a whole world of trouble. It's the kind of thing that guys lose their jobs over, so I couldn't afford to play fast and loose with my timing. And in my case, the risk was extra high since I had a high value load of electronics, new TVs and such, and every day a delivery is late, the depot can find a trucking company and dramatically lower their bottom line. He puzzles the thought over for a moment and then told me he thought he could help me out, and to wait there for a moment while he fetched something from a back room of the shack. At first I thought it was going to be some pills that would keep me extra wired all night, but what he brought out of the crawfish shack was something that sent chills through me, even thinking about it today. The guy returned with a piece of cypress wood in his hand, like a bear piece, looking like it had been freshly cut from a tree. He had me follow him over to my truck, out of sight of the rest of the crowd that was gathering outside of the shack. Once we were alone, he pulls out this huge knife and tells me to carve my name into the wood, my full name or it won't work. I was just about to ask him what it was when he shushes me, hands me the knife then tells me to obey. The blade looks jagged and slightly bent like it's been home forged or something. This was creepy enough on its own but... It was only when I take the knife from his hand do I see what the handle is made of. You all ever heard of a jawbone knife? It's literally what it sounds like. The blade is obviously metal, but the handle is made of an animal's jawbone. Some places it can be made of a bear or cougar's jaw with the teeth kind of blunted so that it doesn't rip your fingers up. Sounds weird, but they actually make for great grip and they were actually really popular back in the old frontier days but this jawbone knife that he passed me was different. There was something horribly familiar about the shape and size of the teeth, the way only one of them was pointed while the others were flat or jaggedly cupped. I thought it might have been a pig's jaw at first, but the actual jawline was way too thin for that, and it was with terror in my heart that I finally realized what I was looking at. It was human. That jaw had once belonged to a human being. I thought to say something, to ask him where he's gotten his hand on such a thing. I mean, I wanted to shove him away and throw his wooden board right back at him, but I'm telling you, when a guy has handed you a knife that you strongly suspect is made of a freaking human jawbone, you ain't nothing but polite to him. So I did as I was asked, carved my name into the wood, then handed him back the knife, all the while he seemed to take an immense amount of pleasure in knowing how afraid I was. He then tells me that he's going to bury the piece of wood out in the bayou somewhere and that once he'd done that, I'd get to Dallas with loads of time and that I wouldn't have to worry about a thing. Long story short, I did get to Dallas on time. I was wide awake for the entire journey, made every exit and turn just like I was supposed to, but I was only so focused on the journey ahead because I wanted to keep the thoughts of where that knife had come from out of my mind, so I suppose... In a manner of speaking, the little ritual did work. Maybe not in the way that he had intended to, where some weird bayou spirits had taken care of me for the remainder of my journey, but it was the thing that spurred me on to get away from that crawfish shack and on to my destination. So a few Saturdays ago now, I got a text from my little sister that went something like this. Hey bro, I'm gonna drive up to granddad's for a few hours to check in on him. I think he's been pretty lonely because of this whole lockdown thing and I think we should pay him a visit. I know what you're thinking and don't worry. He has that glad porch built so, so we can sit in his front garden while he sits inside and we can have a little chat. I'll bring flash of coffee and some cake for lunch. Are you up for joining me? I was snowed under with work and it had bled into my weekend so despite the fact that I should have just stayed home, I knew I needed to get out of my apartment for a while. So I agreed to join her. It was unusually nice weather out even for a British summer so I thought why not. Besides, I hadn't seen my granddad in like two or three months at that point so I really missed him and as long as we kept from getting too close to him physically, I didn't see the harm in paying him a visit. 
So my sister arrives in her beat-up old Volkswagen Golf at around noon, and we start the drive out to our granddad's. We're having our own little catch-up. Talks range from the stuff surrounding the virus to YouTube channels we've been binging since we've been cooped up at home. I recommend Let's Read to Her, whoop whoop. All is going well, and I'm using my phone map app to help her navigate, so I've got my eyes glued to my phone screen, whereas she's obviously watching the road. She's a very chatty person, so I did think it was unusual when she stopped talking altogether for a few minutes, but nothing to worry about too much. I mean, I just figured she was concentrating. I only realized something was actually wrong when she said something like, What's wrong with that car? I look up and ask which one she was talking about. But as I looked, it was obvious which one she was talking about. We're stopped at some traffic lights as this is happening, and at the head of one of the lines of cars, I see this gray Vauxhall estate. Its entire back window is blocked from all kinds of stuff filling the boot, which is dangerous enough on its own. But it's also sat there stationary doing that peep and creep thing you can make a car do from just gently pressing on the clutch. At first, I just thought it was kind of funny that it seemed to me like they were just trying to make their boring old dad car bounce like some kind of Compton lowrider and made a comment to my sister about why this is why dads should put away their Dr. Dre 2001 records after they turn 40. So the light turns green and we start moving again. But the gray voxel at the head of the line next to us just sits there, not moving. So this actually gives me a chance to get a look into the car's front seats and catch a glimpse of the driver. I don't know what I was expecting. Maybe some white dude in wraparound shades lip-syncing to explosive or something relatively humorous like that, but what I actually saw was anything but amusing. This dude had shades on all right, but the way he was just slumping in the driver's seat, head slopping off to one side, it was obvious that he was drunk. And not just, I've just had a few too many in the pub drunk. I mean, this fellow was absolutely bladdered. Like so drunk he looked barely conscious. We hear a few beeping horns as the people behind him are evidently annoyed that he's just sat there not paying attention to the lights and I honestly thought that since we'd gotten past him that it'd be the end of it. But nope. We hear this massively aggressive revving engine noise as the dude zooms past us again all before he just switches lanes so that he's right in front of us. Then he slows down right down so that I had to tell my sister to slow down too so we could maintain a safe distance between us. He then starts swerving from side to side ahead of us as we pass onto a smaller road, so badly that cars coming the other way are swerving and beeping their horns at him for fear of him slamming into them. I know this isn't the scariest idea ever. He wasn't a bloody vampire or a skinwalker or whatever else seems to dominate all those creepypasta forums but I cannot overstate how unnerving it is to see such a dangerous driver on the roads, like right in front of you. It was how unpredictable he was acting too, like my heart was pounding, considering that he could just swerve into oncoming traffic or slam on his brakes at any moment when it might be way too late for us to stop ourselves and turn. We made sure to keep a safe distance as the road opened up in front of us again, into a full-on dual carriageway, but he switches lanes yet again, again risking causing a bloody accident, but again making it so that he's on our right-hand side as we come up to a set of traffic lights. Don't look at him. Just be cool. Don't look into his car. I tell my sister, who is like doubly nervous as me because she's actually the one at the wheel, and it's her car we're driving in. But here's the thing. My sister is blonde, and she gets quite a lot of attention from boys, something that has always been stressful for me. Those of you with younger siblings will probably understand exactly what I'm talking about. You just feel super protective of them. So when I heard that doom 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 sound and looked to see the dirty drunk driver banging on his passenger window, I knew what was about to happen. I instinctively turned up our car's radio and again reiterated for her not to look at the car at all. But she was well practiced at ignoring thirsty guys so that wasn't really an issue. But there was a new concern now, that he was going to follow us, and follow us he did. As the lights turn green, the drunk driver keeps level with us as we all start moving. He winds down his passenger window and starts shouting over the din of the engines and traffic, but thank God for the car radio, we could only faintly hear him. 
My sister is keeping her eyes on the road and I'm staring the guy out at this point, like I'm scared but I'm only just really bloody angry now. He's shouting at her, making disgusting gestures with his fingers and tongue. I was ashamed that another grown man could ever act like that. He's not paying attention to the road and he's not paying attention to his own driving either so I watch in absolute horror as he starts drifting over to us slowly but surely. His passenger door is getting closer and closer to my sister's side of the car as he noticed me staring and switches his attention towards me, instantly becoming extremely aggressive as the expression behind his sunglasses changes radically. I could hear him clearly over the car radio now, screaming through his passenger window stuff like, what are you looking at? Along with other stuff I don't think would be appropriate to write out for polite company. I start warning my sister to edge off to the side of the road, which she does, and we're moving off the dual carriageway into a small road this time, so she ends up slowing down and stopping behind the van of a dude who was working on an electrical box just a few meters away. The drunk driver follows us though, and actually has to swerve hard to avoid smashing into the parked van, which causes yet more beeping from the cars behind the drunk driver as he's pretty much forced to carry on off down the road. I'm thanking God out loud that we've lost the dude at this point, and I turn towards my little sister to see if she's okay, and she just burst into tears, leaning her head onto the steering wheel and sobbing. I can't even blame her. She finds driving stressful at the best of times, let alone when some drunk, dangerously driving pervert is giving her all kinds of unwanted attention. She was crying so loud that the electrician fella who was working away, whose attention was drawn away anyway because the drunk driver that nearly just smashed into his car, earning himself a torrent of beeps, ended up coming over to ask if she was okay. I was giving my sister little pats on the back as I wound down my window and explained what the guy was up to, and how he'd almost just caused a serious accident through being a drunk and a perv. And when the electrician asked if I made a note of the guy's number plate... I was just kicking myself. I had been so intensely scared of what might happen that it didn't even occur to me to make a record of the guy's number plate. I felt like a moron, but I was somewhat consoled by the idea that someone else might have had the presence of mind to do what I'd neglected to, and I sincerely hope someone did. That fella shouldn't have been on the roads at all, and I really, really hope he didn't cause an accident further on down the road. We ended up being late to our granddad's, but... He didn't mind at all once we explained why we were so late, and he was just as outraged as we were that such a thing could even occur in the first place. Well, that's my story. I know it wasn't nearly as scary as some of the others that get posted here. What with all the stalkers or catfish psychos that people have the misfortune to run into, but I literally can't remember a time when something has had me literally shaking with adrenaline like that did. We all tend to feel safe while on the roads, to the point where some people find driving to actually be kind of a boring experience, but it only takes something like that drunk driver to remind us all how vulnerable we really are. I enlisted in the US Army on my 18th birthday. Both my father and grandfather had the honor of embarking on a military career and had both seen combat in the Gulf and Vietnam respectively. Unlike my dad, whose war had lasted little more than a hundred hours, my grandfather had done two tours of Vietnam with the 101st Airborne and had actually lost his left hand during the battle in the Ah Chau Valley in 1969. Because of this, he insisted that I do everything in my power to avoid direct combat duty. He told me the stress had almost killed him when my dad went off into the desert to fight the army of Saddam Hussein. He couldn't face losing his son, and he wouldn't have that same stress on his mind if his grandson went off into combat duty either. So, I ended up as an 88M, a motor transport operator. Motor transport operators are mainly responsible for overseeing or driving vehicles to transport either personnel or vital supplies. We are the backbone of the U.S. Army's sustainment and support structure, providing essential advanced mobility both on and off the battlefield. I was sure to avoid direct combat duty in this role, but that didn't mean I would be exempt from a deployment to one of the U.S. Army's most dangerous and intense areas of operation since the Vietnam War, Afghanistan. 
My family and I had one last meal at my grandfather's place before I deployed, and if I'm honest, it was very emotional. My dad was proud. My mom was a nervous wreck who was only kept together by the fact that she had so much food to prepare, but it was my grandfather's little talk that he gave me that really had me falling to pieces. Like my dad, he was proud of me for serving his country, but he told me some of the things that he had seen during his time in Vietnam, things that clearly haunted him for a long, long time after he rotated back stateside. He told me that there were no heroes in war, not in the sense that the movies try to make it out. He told me ideas that get men killed in dumb, needless ways, and a lot of the kids he'd seen take a bullet in the Aishaw Valley had sadly mistaken bravery for stupidity. Basically, he told me that there were only two things I should focus on, doing my job and getting home. He told me I would be a hero to the infantry guys who needed the bullets, the bandages, and the beans, and I had absolutely nobody to prove myself to. That the highest reward wasn't medals or glory or killing America's enemies. It was about being able to go home to your family, something that so many of his Vietnam buddies hadn't been able to do. My story takes place during the third month of my year-long deployment to Nangarhar Province, Afghanistan. I was assigned to Troop D, 1st Squadron, 61st Cavalry Regiment. As I had been driving army trucks for about three years by that time, it was actually one of the more experienced guys. Troop D was tasked with running combat logistical patrols between Fobs, Connolly, and Fenty, which was about an hour away near the city of Jalalabad. And although the drive between the bases only lasted a couple of hours, depending on the size of the load we were toting, the preparation time for the convoys made for very long days. We'd had a few close calls as far as attacks on our convoys went. We'd come under sniper attack at one point. There, the bulletproof windows of my 20-ton load handler got cracked from where the sniper's bullet slammed into it. That was a pretty intense day. If it would have penetrated, it'd have hit my vehicle commander right in the face or neck, and that would have definitely ruined both our days. We also had a couple of IED scares, but honestly, those were just more boring than anything else. The lead vehicle in the convoy would spot something suspicious at the side of the road, an unusual mound of earth or a burned out car or something. Then, we'd have to wait hours and hours on end waiting for EOD, the bomb disposal guys, to show up and declare it safe before we could continue. But without a shadow of doubt, the worst and most terrifying thing that happened during my entire tour happened on a supply run one hot summer's day in May. The area we were rolling through was mostly farmland, with the odd small village interspersed throughout the arid, rocky terrain. It wasn't unusual to see the farmers working their fields as we passed through, and some of them even gave us friendly waves, with their kids jumping up and down excitedly at the sight of such huge vehicles driving along the dusty dirt roads. Only this one day, we couldn't see a single person out in their fields, which is usually what we call an atmospheric indicator. This is when a certain detail in the environment lets us know that the chances of a firefight happening is higher than usual, and a lack of civilians in the area is one of those. However, in the distance, I see this one lone kid pushing a wheelbarrow through one of the fields. This then gets reported over the radio, and it pretty much sets our mind at ease because there's no way the Taliban were about to initiate an ambush with one of the farmer kids working away on his lonesome. After all, they relied on the approval and good faith of the locals for their insurgency, just as much as we did for our counterinsurgency. Our lead vehicle stops just short of the kid who's trying his hardest to push his fully laden wheelbarrow up a little embankment that connected his farmer dad's, or uncle's, who am I to know, field to the road itself. We watched him, straining and pushing at his wheelbarrow, but kept on failing as it rolled back down the slope. There were a few moments where I thought it might topple over on top of him, and I'd have really hated to see that kid get hurt like that. I think it's why I was so relieved to hear one of our sergeants over the radio, telling us to stand by because he was going to jump out of his truck to help the kid get his barrel over the road. Like I said, we relied on the goodwill of locals for information and whatnot, so that kind of aid was very, very essential to our overall success in the area. Our sergeant approaches the kid, gives him a little wave and says his salams, and the kid smiles and returns the wave. 
The sergeant then points at the wheelbarrow and mimes pushing it up the embankment. The kid looks like he's thinking for a moment, then gives him a nod. The sergeant gives him a thumbs up. The kid returns it, and everything is all right. The kid backs off the barrel, and the sergeant steps in, takes hold of the handles, and begins to push it up the embankment, but is clearly struggling. Not as much as the kid, but struggling nonetheless. Whatever was in there must have been really heavy and was covered by a large piece of tarp. Our sergeant let go of the handles of the wheelbarrow and leans over and lifts the tarp slightly. Then he starts to move back towards the convoy, hand on his radio set before his screams start to buzz over all of our radios. Move back! Move the F back! IED! IED! I... His last word was cut off by a huge explosion, one which kicked up a huge ball of dust which engulfed all of our vehicles and plunged my truck's cab into darkness. We call it a brownout when there's so much dust in the air that you can only see like two feet in front of you, sometimes not even that. In the immediate aftermath, a dozen voices started shouting on our radios demanding to know what had happened and what we were supposed to do. Our lieutenant immediately called for comms discipline, silencing all the panicked voices before declaring that we'd been struck by a roadside bomb. I'm not sure any of us quite knew what had happened in the minutes that followed, even our vehicle, who had one of the best views, just didn't quite want to believe what we'd seen. Our sergeant was KIA the moment the IED went off, which was concealed in the wheelbarrow the kid had been pushing. The kid had absolutely no idea what was in there either. He had no desire to run away before it went off. He wasn't in the least bit suspicious or contemptuous towards us as we approached. Rumors went around that ended up getting confirmed that the Taliban had paid the kid's family a few dollars to push the barrel towards us so they could detonate it when the kid got close. It's stuff like that which scared me the most during my tour. I met some Afghans when I was over there that were some of the kindest, most gentle souls I'd ever met, every bit as peaceful and freedom-loving as the average rural American. But the people that fought us, the people that schemed to turn kids into human bombs, and then justified it to themselves like they were doing the right thing. That's what gave me sleepless nights over there, as well as sleepless nights after I got back to the States. The scariest thing to ever happen to me on a road trip or highway happened way back when I was a kid. My mom and dad had arranged a little weekend getaway for themselves, so they took us over to my aunt's place so we could hang out with our cousins and whatnot while they got themselves some well-deserved peace and quiet. We spent the first day just playing in a local park, throwing a football around, just doing the things that kids do, but the next day, my aunt and another aunt of mine decided to drive us somewhere for some activity I can't even remember now. I mean, this is so long ago that I can't even remember where we were driving or why. I remember being in the back seat, bored out of my skull, and just watching the road ahead of us through the gap in the sheets. What I find kind of weird is how some details in this incident are burned into my memory, while others completely escape me. I suppose that's just how memory works sometimes, so excuse me if this account seems spotty, but I think you'll all get the gist of it. On the road ahead of us was a brick red pickup truck, its rear storage space crammed with building equipment. I distinctly remember a bunch of bricks and building sand and balanced on top, secured by some rope or some other kinds of cordage, was a large rusted wheelbarrow. A sheet of blue plastic tarp was flapping violently in the wind, and as the truck drove on ahead of us, I remember seeing the whole load rumbling and shaking in a way that, in retrospect, should have made me feel distinctly uncomfortable. I remember my aunt commenting on it, how they were pretty worried about how poorly the truck's load was secured, but I didn't really think anything of it when you're as young as I was, you just don't consider certain possibilities or dangers. So I had no idea what was about to happen, and when it did, the whole thing scared the life out of me in a way that I don't think I'd ever felt. I watched in absolute horror as the wheelbarrow came loose and fell off the back of the truck. It didn't happen in stages. It didn't slip and slip and then fall, so that my aunt, who was driving, had time to swerve or back off or whatever. It just fell, 
Suddenly and violently, right off the back of the pickup and into the road as the car I was in continued to speed towards it. My aunt screamed, one throwing her hands up to her face as she obviously expected the thing to slam into the windshield of the car. We were on the highway at the time, driving at maybe 60 or 70 miles an hour, and at those speeds, there's no telling what kind of catastrophic damage it would have caused. But somehow the wheelbarrow hit the road and actually bounced. It bounced in a way I never thought possible for something made of almost entirely metal. Maybe it landed on its rubber wheel first, and that's what gave it a little extra momentum, but somehow it narrowly missed the windshield and scraped against the roof of the car. An orchestra of beeping car horns erupted behind us as we slowed to a stop, but my aunts knew they weren't directed at them for slowing to a stop. I remember a guy from the car behind getting out to see if we were okay, and thank God we were, whereas the pickup in front of us just kept going, probably knowing full well that they'd be subject to arrest or something for not securing their load properly. So yeah, that's definitely the scariest thing I'd ever have happen to me on a car journey, by a long shot. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, good night, sleep tight, and don't let the bed bugs suck your toes.